We move on now to the uh, trial of George Zimmerman. State prosecutors have resumed hearing testimony from Florida police officer Chris Serino today. He was one of the first officers to interrogate George Zimmerman. As we continue our coverage of the killing of Trayvon Martin, the George Zimmerman trial, the prosecution is now focusing heavily on scientific evidence and statements Zimmerman made immediately after the shooting. Prosecutors played an audio recording of George Zimmerman telling police what happened the night he shot and killed Trayvon Martin. Zimmerman says he had gotten out of his car to find a street sign to give police his location. I was walking back through to where my car was and he jumped out from the bushes and he said, what the f is your problem, homie? Jurors also saw a reenactment Zimmerman did with police the next day. The neighborhood watchman says the 17-year-old was beating him up and reached for his gun. He said, you're going to die tonight, motherfucker. And he reached for me. He reached, like, I felt his arm going down to my side. And I grabbed it, and I just grabbed my firearm and I shot him. In the recordings, Zimmerman said he repeatedly screamed for help. A scream was caught on a 911 call made that night. So you think he's yelling help? Yes. All right, what is your... A senior FBI audio expert testified the scream, which lasted about three seconds, is not long enough to identify. That type of, uh, you know, voice sample utterance is not fit for the uh, purpose of voice comparison. But during his testimony, the FBI expert said it may be easier for someone familiar with the voice to identify it. Legal experts say the prosecution wants jurors to hear that before they call Martin's mother to the stand. Ms. Fulton can come in and basically say, I've heard his screams. Those are his screams. The defense argues the voice is Zimmerman's. Our guest to weigh in with some perspective on how the Zimmerman trial is proceeding is famed attorney Christopher Darden, who is best known for his prosecution role in the double murder trial of O.J. Simpson. He joins us on the phone this morning from Los Angeles. Christopher, thank you so much for taking some time with us. I imagine that you've been busy, particularly with your own defense practice, but also uh, as this trial has proceeded. Uh, I want you to talk to me just a little bit about some of the pressures that are unique to a high-profile case like this one. Well, it, you know, it takes a lot of time to prepare a case uh, as complicated as this one, especially when you're under the media spotlight. So, you know, I, I would imagine that these lawyers have been working around the clock now for the past couple of months just to get ready. You know, some people feel that it takes a whole day of preparation sometimes just to present a single hour of, uh, of quality testimony. And, of course, there's the fact that the media is watching. And, uh, you know, the lawyer that wins this case uh, you know, will likely become rich. <laughs> so there's a, lot, there's a lot at stake personally. Are you speaking from experience there, Christopher? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm taking it from other people's experiences, Debbie. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, if you were in the position to give, let's start with the prosecution, because now you've worked on both sides uh, of the aisle. Uh, as a prosecutor, if you were to give them some advice right now in terms of how they're presenting the case, what would you say to them? Well, I think they have to be a little bit more aggressive uh, in, in making sure that evidence that I think is otherwise inadmissible uh, doesn't come in. For instance, one of the lead detectives was asked to gauge the truthfulness of Zimmerman in terms of the statements he made to police. Uh, you know, is he, uh, is he a liar or, or was he being helpful and, and did he appear to be telling the truth? And for a, a police officer who does not know Zimmerman, uh, to, to, to share his opinion that Zimmerman appeared truthful and helpful, I, I think that that undermines the prosecution. I think it's an opinion that this officer technically and legally should not be allowed to offer. And, and I think that I think things like that damage their case. The prosecution is allowing every prosecution witness to somehow be twisted and turned uh, so as to provide helpful information and evidence for the defense. And that seems to be happening with every witness at every time. You know, it is so interesting from the very beginning of this trial with opening testimonies, the styles of prosecution and the defense have been vastly different. The prosecution seems to be very straightforward, very uh, efficient and expedient, even quick in how they present their information. On the other hand, the defense has been very methodical, very slow, and in some cases perhaps even painstaking. Which style is going to serve which side best with the jury? 
Well, you know, after having been a prosecutor for 16 years and now having uh, practiced as a defense attorney for another 16 years, yeah. Uh, number one, my view is that if 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 you as a defense attorney can um, sort of knock the prosecution off their game, I mean, they like to present evidence in a very methodical and precise way. And my experience is that when you can when you can throw them off kilter, uh, you can you know you can take advantage of them somewhat. But there, you know, but there's no quick and easy way to prosecute or to defend this case. I think the defense is going in a very slow and plotting kind of way because they're they're looking for any nugget, uh, anything they can find. And so and, and they've been finding things. And sp- but, you know, it takes a while. It takes a while. Speaking of which, uh, uh, some people are speculating that the case is already over. I believe the New York Times has said that the the prosecution has already lost this case. That the defense has done their job in introducing reasonable doubt. What are your thoughts? Well, I think the prosecution has done the job for them, and, and, and it's not their fault. It's not the prosecution's fault. The fact of the matter is, is that to make this case, if they have any chance at making this case, the prosecution was required to play Zimmerman's statements. Those statements are exculpatory. Um, in those statements, he states over and over again that he only fired this shot to save his own life or because he was in fear that uh, Trayvon... Uh, was reaching for his weapon and might kill him, and, and that is the defense. And unfortunately, you know the uh, the prosecution's case is inundated with that. Uh, you know, I wonder what your evaluation is of where we are in race relations. Of course, you were involved with the O.J. Simpson trial, which was really less about race, more about celebrity and status. Shortly thereafter, though, came the Rodney King trial. Uh, have we moved forward, or does it feel like we're in the exact same place with this George Zimmerman trial? Well, you know, it seems to me that we're either in the exact same place, or perhaps we've even taken a step backwards. I mean, you would think that given the, the racial makeup, of the president of the United States, that that you now people would feel good about each other and uh, and and about our racial differences. But given the Supreme Court's ruling on the Voting Rights Act last week, um, uh, and the obvious racial divide that that, that appears that, that seems to appear uh, in terms of the Zimmerman trial, it indicates to me that we're in the same place, if not if not going backwards. I mean, this is a case; it's a race case, and. It was made into a race case, you know, by the victim's family, uh, by Zimmerman, who, who I agree, uh, racially profiled this young man. But then there are all of these other people, civil rights leaders, talking heads on television, who just exacerbated the situation uh, and made this into a race case. The prosecution, I mean, the defense played their race card last week when they asked the young lady about statements that Trayvon supposedly made about a, uh, a slur, uh, a slur that he supposedly used in reference to Caucasian. Yeah, indeed. It's, in- uh, you know, it's, it's not good. It's not looking good. Christopher Dard, we want to thank you so much for taking some time to speak with us, and uh, perhaps we can talk to you again before the trial is over. Thank you. My pleasure. Joining us now to watch the Zimmerman proceedings is Arise News contributor Dorian Warren. He is a political science professor at Columbia University and a great friend of Arise America. It's good to see you, Dorian. Good to see you, Debbie. Right now on the stand, the trial is ongoing, and um, uh, Christopher Serino is being questioned, who is one of the investigators that questioned George Zimmerman uh, Mm -hmm. shortly after the shooting. So let's listen in live, and we'll talk about it on the back end. Anything wrong with following somebody like that? That Let me ask you this way. Anything illegal? I'm sorry. I'll let him answer that one. Repeat it, please. Anything, did you think that there was anything wrong with him following him to see where he was going? Legally speaking, no. Okay. Um, matter of fact, it was, and you heard the non-emergency call, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And it was twice on that that the non-emergency operator asked Mrs. Zimmerman, tell me if he does anything else. Yes, I believe that was said. Right? Yes. Does that indicate that he wants him to keep an eye on him? Yes, sir. And you said following him is not legally improper, correct? It's not illegal. No Even sense. approaching somebody is not legally improper, is it? 
that's open for interpretation. Um, Tell me what crime you believe would occur if I were to walk up to you on the street and say, hi. In that manner, none whatsoever. How about, what are you doing here? None whatsoever. How about, get the hell out of here? None whatsoever. How about, I don't like the way you're dressed. I don't like the fact that you have gray on. Get out of my face. That could be construed as confrontational. Sure, but is that Not illegal. crime? No. no, sir. And when the this operator who said twice, tell me if he does anything else, then says, are you following him? What does Mrs. Zimmerman say? He says yes. And in your investigation, is there anything at all to suggest at that time that Mr. Zimmerman continued to follow Mr. Martin? At which point, sir? At the I'm point that the officer said, or the non-emergency operator said, we don't need you to do that, and Mr. Zimmerman said, okay. I would say yes, there was. And what, would, what evidence would you have? Um, his end location. I'm sorry? Had, his end location, the location where the incident ultimately ended. Okay. So the fact that, my approach to the witness, Your Honor? <clears throat> State is at 139. Because you know the event started where? The event, as far as I'm concerned, started off that map. Okay. okay. I'm talking about the, the physical altercation. <laughs> I apologize. My understanding from, well, what's your understanding as to when Mr. Zimmerman got to this area, what path he took? Can I stand? Please do. Could you face forward? Yes. Okay, my understanding of the interpretation is he's coming this way, he walks. So I got a pointer. Okay, he walks, per his statement, all the way over here. He says he doesn't see him. He says he doesn't see him. Okay, and the altercation, physical altercation started right there, approximately. Okay, great, thank you. So, with that as context, then, Do you know exactly where Mr. Zimmerman was when the non-emergency operator said, we don't need you to do that? Based on his statement, um, he was at his vehicle, which would have been, I believe, off of that or wherever he parked it. Yeah, based on his statement, he was at his vehicle, which would have been, I believe. Wherever he parked it on Twin, tree, twin it's, Trees. It's your understanding of the investigation that Mrs. Zimmerman was at his vehicle when the officer said, we don't need you to do that? That was when he was exiting his vehicle. That's okay. my understanding, yeah. Okay, and then how many seconds went forward as he was walking before that conversation occurred? I'd have to. Facts, not an evidence, but <clears throat> walking. Sustained. How many seconds? You heard the tape where you can hear him getting out of the car, correct? Well, I heard the the sound of the door being opened, which I interpreted that. That yes. he got out of the car, yes. right? And then you know that he was going, he was walking in some direction because he said to the officer in response to, are you following him? He said yes, right? Objection is the facts not an evidence, walking, assuming a fact okay. not an Rephrase evidence. Rephrase your question. You know that he was following him because he told the um, non-emergency operator that he was, right? Yes, sir. And you know from the conversation that Mrs. Zimmerman indicated to the non-emergency operator that he had cut between the buildings, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so I might approach again. So just what we're clear with what you just testified mm -hmm. to. He parked his car somewhere in this area, correct? Correct. Well, and then, go ahead. Back around here somewhere. Right. So he's at... I'd have to hear it again, obviously. Could, but, could you face forward? Uh, yeah, I'd have to hear it again, obviously, but somewhere very shortly thereafter, leaving his car, that's when it was asked, are you following him? Okay. And he said yes. And Mrs. Zimmerman indicated that Mr. Martin had gone between the 
buildings. He was out of sight, correct? Yes. Yet, you testified a moment ago that, pursuant to Mr. Zimmerman's statement, he had gone down to retreat you circle, correct? Well, that was his statement, but as far as him having a visual on when he might have got out of the vehicle, I really don't know. I can't say it wasn't there. But he could have seen him at any point which way he was running. Am I making myself clear? I mean, well, the jury can decide that. I'll try and okay. walk you through a little bit yeah. more. Um, so my question a little while ago was whether or not you had any evidence to support any contention that Mr. Zimmerman continued to follow Trayvon Martin after being told not to. Do you have any evidence to support that? I would answer, I have information, yes, that there was, just based on where we located Trayvon and the fact that the altercation happened after his conversation. That's my interpretation. Let that, me ask yes, you this there was way. Some Let me ask following. you this way. Do you have anything to contradict Mrs. Zimmerman's statement that he walked the rest of the way to Retreat View Circle and was coming back towards his car when the interaction, whatever it was, between Trayvon Martin and him occurred? Nothing tangible, no. <clears throat> not, not, go intangible on us then. So what do you mean nothing tangible? What do you have? And, 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 and the circumstances and the totality of the whole thing that I'm looking at, as I interpreted it, when he says follow, walking behind, trying to find a direction, I construe that as follow. He was trying to do something in the same direction where Trayvon was going. He was and trying to see as, where he was. As far as the word follow, um, as my report may indicate, I mean, it's, you know, but it's open for interpretation. And as your report indicates, there's nothing to suggest that Trayvon Martin went straight down Retreat View Circle, towards Retreat View Circle. He went between the buildings, correct? According to statements made by Mrs. Zimmerman. According and, to statements made by Ukraine, yeah. And of course, all of those statements, including Mrs. Zimmerman saying that he was attacked by Trayvon Martin coming from that area as well, mm. correct? Correct. Anything to contradict that? No, sir. We are watching live the trial of George Zimmerman on the stand right now is Sanford Police Detective Christopher Serino, who is being questioned by lead defense attorney Mark Romera and making some really, really interesting points. We want to talk about what's uh, happening here and the significance of it. Joining me here in the studio are Dorian Warren, who is a professor of political science at uh, Columbia University, as well as Dolores Jones Brown, uh, to talk about this. And welcome back. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for uh, this is this is. Fascinating and riveting. It's, it seems to me that Mark O'Mara is trying to establish that although George Zimmerman got out of the car, that uh, it was Trayvon Martin that apparently changed his course, double back to try to surprise him. Is that what's, what's happening here? That's, that's, that's what the defense is trying to do, but the prosecution on re-examine had several key points. This is going to be very important testimony for the prosecution today. Number one, Detective Sereno admitted that Zimmerman saying effing punks on the call is a sign of ill will, spite, and hatred. Number two, he admitted to the prosecution that he thought Zimmerman explicitly was following Trayvon. Number three, even though Zimmerman said in a statement he got out the car to find the address, the prosecution was able to show that the addresses were clearly visible from exactly where he was. And then last but not least, there's an in, there was inconsistencies pointed out this morning between what Zimmerman said in a statement about placing Trayvon's arms out and the actual pictures that show Trayvon's arms underneath his body. So all of those, I mean, that's at least four you know, killer points that the prosecution, for lack of a better term, the prosecution pointed out this morning, even though the defense, this is supposed to be the defense's moment. And, and these testimonies, particularly of the Sanford Police uh, Department, is really about the inconsistencies and, try, and trying to parse out what really happened uh, in between all of these varying statements. This is a serious question of credibility for Mr. Zimmerman's statements. Um, the notion that he had to get out of the car to figure out where he was when he was, in fact, the Neighborhood Watch volunteer captain doesn't make any logical sense. Uh, the fact that he doesn't return to the car if he's already outside the car when the police say, we don't need you to follow him, means that he, as um, Dorian. Dorian said, um, 
had some level of ill will, he was in some way motivated to follow this person, even though the police said, we don't need you to follow. The whole notion that someone reached for his gun, which is in the holster at his waist, it just isn't logical at all either. And there's still the big question of why are you carrying a gun in a gated community where there's been no agreement, even as a watch captain, you would be permitted to use any firearms. And there's this whole question of, well, I'm concerned about burglaries, but burglaries are property crimes. Mm -hmm. And we're not allowed to use deadly physical force to protect property. So there are all kinds of illogical uh, statements being made, and there are serious credibility questions in the statement that Zimmerman gives to the officer and uh, his whole position about how this uh, incident occurred. The fact is, he put this dangerous situation in motion, and he took the life of a child, and it shouldn't matter that it was a black child. And I think it's a travesty that this trial has come down to be about race. You know, and there's so many other uh, uh, inconsistencies, as you guys have already pointed out. Even yesterday, mm -hmm. there, there was the testimony that, Tra that uh, George Zimmerman said in his statement, I believe it was to Singleton, uh, that uh, Trayvon Martin had his hands over his mouth no. and nose, no. and that he had difficulty breathing. But then said he was screaming for help. Right. Uh, so how can... And even the officer said, well, wait a minute. You know, was your mouth covered or were you screaming for help? Right. Which was it? But in the face of all those, if we go all the way back to a year ago, mm. uh, still those kinds of uh, inconsistencies didn't rise to a level to bring charges, to detain him. You know, the, this is an example of great detective work, and I think we're seeing this yesterday and today. So the detectives were rightfully suspicious of Zimmerman's stories and asked the right questions to try to poke at those inconsistencies. And in fact, Detective Serrano suggested over a year ago that he be arrested and, and, and tried for manslaughter, on manslaughter charges. So well, since you brought that up, Dorian, let's talk about the charges, because, of course, we know that George Zimmerman is charged with second-degree second degree murder, murder uh, which has quite a high bar for the prosecution to have to, to, have to reach. I, I wonder where this charge came from, considering, as you say, Serino recommended a manslaughter charge. Well, the state did not want to, you know, it was a, it was a special uh, appointed prosecutor that had to bring the charges in the first place. There was, you know, there was a long time that went by before Zimmerman was arrested and before any charges were brought, despite the, the recommendations of the detective. So there, so there by itself, there's, a, there's some questions about why weren't the detectives trusted in terms of their expertise and their, invest, and their interviews with Zimmerman and then their recommendations. Why weren't they trusted initially relative to how long it took to actually bring Zimmerman to trial? And I think the detectives are playing an interesting role here, Serrano in particular, yesterday and today, by essentially trying to make the case for second degree murder, even though he thinks the charge should have initially been manslaughter, his testimony seems to be trying to help out the prosecution. Now, very, very quickly, could this charge, this perhaps overcharging of George Zimmerman, be the, be the one open door, open window to allow him to be acquitted? I'm very concerned that this entire trial turns out to be a sham. Mm. Um, the jury selection gives me cause, pause, cause for pause, uh, in that we have the majority white women, and we know from social science that, mm. you know, white women do tend to be afraid of young black males. And so there is this way in which I'm starting to feel that we, the black community, get a trial, but in the end, the prosecution may not tell as good a story that needs to be told for this trial to result in conviction. And it may have started as early as with the overcharging, if we'd want to call it that, because I don't understand why there aren't alternative charges beyond the second-degree murder. Well, this trial is still ongoing, and we're not even halfway there, so there'll be plenty of opportunities to examine this more. Dorian Warman, good to see you. Good Thank to see you so you. much. Thank you. Dolores Jones-Brown, thank you, as always. I, I feel like we'll talk to you again before thank this you. whole process is all over. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you for having us.